what's up everybody? So see. Just bringing you another coronavirus uh, SARS COV-19-2 update. Um, things are really starting to ramp up. Uh, again, keep in mind that all the public numbers are tested numbers. Uh, that's not a real accurate count of everything. We have to multiply things a minimum by 10. I know it sounds crazy, but we have to multiply everything by an, at least a number of 10. And in some areas, depending upon uh, social uh, interactions and, and you know just the general public and how their you know social structure is done it could be 20 times the numbers that we're seeing in those particular zones so uh, you know in America people don't greet each other by kissing each other on the face you know mwah, mwah. you know that's that's not something that we do here so the numbers would be lower than here uh, here than they would be somewhere like Italy where people do greet each other by kissing each other on the face or uh, Iran, where they always kiss each other on the face, even the guys. You know what I mean? So, so in those places, things are going to get pretty bad because of their social habits. But all in all, we have to be able to, to double these numbers in our minds. When we see them on the news, we have to double these numbers by at least 10. Because that's what we're looking at with a, uh, you know, a, a coronavirus such as this one. Um, even the last coronavirus, the one that was really bad with SARS, uh, even that was only transmissible when you were showing symptoms, you know. So if you weren't showing symptoms, then you weren't contagious with that pathogen. With this one, it doesn't matter. You can have it and not be showing any signs at all and still be passing it on to other people. <clears throat> so... Here we are, uh, weeks later, months later now, since we started talking about this, since I started talking about this, and I tried to tell people where it was going, exactly where it was going, and nobody wanted to listen. Nobody. It's just crazy how, how people can pour their heart out into trying to let people know and it still falls on deaf ears even when you're showing them proof. You can show people evidence and because some politicians got on TV and told everybody everything was okay, everybody stayed calm for months and now here we are. But the people like myself that tried to warn people, tried to tell people, what happened? We were shunned off as conspiracy theorists. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. No, I don't know what I'm talking about. But I share information from people who do. I don't know. Maybe people will get their minds right now. And I, I have a strong feeling that this is going to change people in the world. Like 9-11 uh, like changed America. You know, people are going to wash their hands better now. People are going to pay mind to sticking their hands in their mouths. A lot of people are going to stop biting their nails. A lot of crazy habits are going to end through this. Uh, bad habits anyway. You know, people that live nasty. All that's going to change. People are really going to start taking their health seriously after this, which is a good thing. But the bad thing is, the people that are going to die from this in America, as it's hitting us at this point, are going to be dead before the summer's over. So think about that for a minute. Everyone that's going to die from this in America, that's where I'm at, because the numbers are hitting the way they are. The infection rate's gonna skyrocket, 
somewhere around next month, which is April, maybe into May. By mid-June, maybe July, we'll be on our way back down from our surge. But that's going to leave a wake of pain and heartache for the loved ones that we're going to lose between now and then. Say, oh, this regular flu, regular flu kills so many people. Right. In a whole year, it might kill 30,000 people. This is going to kill astronomically more people than that in just a few months. And it's going to continue to trickle on killing people between now and the time they get a vaccine, which is looking at next summer. Not this summer, next summer. So this is just going to be the main hit. And my guess is around maybe 20 million Americans are going to lose their lives between now and mid-June. Numbers don't lie. One plus one is two. Two plus two is four. It doesn't matter. So the R naught value that's associated with this is between three and four. So every person that gets it, depending upon social structure, gives it to from two to three people. It's unavoidable. Please. Click like on the video, share it with everyone that you know. That's how we can make a difference. You know, subscribe if you haven't already. Click the bell so you know when new videos are coming out so you know what's going on. The news isn't going to tell you the truth. The politicians aren't going to tell you the truth. For one, politicians have a job to do. They have to make the, the, the country, the nation look strong. If they go around telling everybody how bad it is, it makes us look vulnerable, it makes us look weak. They're never going to do that. They're never going to do that. I hope you understand that. They are never going to do that. They can't. It's up to us as the people to share the information that we have. Thank you so much everybody again for watching. You guys, please, click like, subscribe, share this video with everyone you know, share the whole playlist. If you haven't seen the other videos, go back and watch them so you can see what's happening, so you can see what has happened in other, in other nations that are technologically advanced and see what's, what they're going through so you can have an idea of what we're ramping up for over the next couple of weeks when this happens. It's going to get a whole lot worse before it gets any better. So I hope everyone is prepared with the things that they need in case of a shutdown. Well, in case of when the shutdown comes, you'll be ready when it does. Thank you, everyone, and good luck. The Joe Rogan experience. What you said when you sat down was absolutely perfect. That the timing could not have been better. Well, tell everybody what you do, Michael. Well, thank you. I'm a, for a lack of a better term, a medical detective. I've spent my whole career tracking infectious diseases down, trying to stop them, trying to understand where they come from so we can make sure they don't happen in the first place. But most of all, 
trying to respond to situations just like this. Just like this. And um, just out, off the bat, how serious is this? Is this something that we need to be terrified of, or is this overblown? Or how, how do you stand on this? Well, first of all, you have to understand the timing of it in the sense that it's just beginning. And so in terms of what hurt, pain, suffering, death has happened so far is really just beginning. Um, this is going to unfold for months to come yet. And that's, I think, what people don't quite yet understand. Um, what we saw in China, uh, I'm convinced, as are many of my colleagues, as soon as they release all of these uh, social distances, these mandated stay in homes, haven't left their home in weeks and weeks kind of thing, when they go back to work, they're on planes, trains, subways, buses, crowded spaces, manufacturing plants, even China is going to come back again. And so this really is acting like an influenza virus, something that transmits very, very easily through the air. We now have data to show that you're infectious before you even get sick. And in some cases, quite highly infectious, just breathing is all that you need to do. So from this perspective, I can understand why people would say, well, wait a minute, flu kills a lot more itself every year than this does. And I remind people this just is beginning. Probably the best guesstimate we have right now on what limited data we have would say this is going to be at least 10 to 15 times worse than the worst seasonal flu year we see. 10 to 15 times worse in terms of fatalities? Yeah, or? yeah, and, and just illness. In fact, I just I brought some numbers. We uh, conservatively estimate that this could in, uh, require 48 million hospitalizations, 96 million uh, cases actually occurring, over 480,000 deaths that can occur over the next three to seven months with this situation. So this is not one that to take lightly. And I think that's what I can understand if you say there's only been 10 deaths or 20 deaths or 50 deaths. Just remember, two weeks ago, we were talking about almost no cases in the United States. And now that we're testing for it and watching the spread as it's unfolding, uh, those numbers are going up astronomically. Three weeks ago, Italy was just living life just fine. Now they're literally in a virtual shutdown in the northern parts of Italy. And that's the challenge with an infectious disease like this. It can spread very quickly, and it also can affect people. I think maybe to put this into modern terms, because this is something we think of often when we think of, of you know, pre-antibiotic days, you know, the old-time medicine. Um, we have an employee at our Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota, and she has a dear friend who lives in Milan, Italy. And she works at a hospital there, and she texts this to this employee of ours last night. And this was an email that came out yesterday from one of their physicians in Milan at the largest hospital there. And he said, I just got a very disturbing message from a cardiologist at one of the Milan's largest hospitals. They're deciding who they have to let die. They aren't screening the staff anymore because they need all hands on deck, and they have very small areas of the hospital dedicated to non-COVID patients where they still screen doctors. Everybody else is dedicated to COVID patients, so even if they're positive, meaning that they're sick, they don't, and, but they don't have a severe cough or fever, then they have to work. Uh, he says that, w that they're seeing an alarming number of cases in the 40-something age range and is ho these are horrible cases. So we need to stop thinking that this is only an old person's disease. This is what I'm going to unfold, not just in Wuhan, but it's unfolding in Milan, it's unfolding here in, in Seattle, and this is what's going to continue to rollingly unfold throughout the world. Yeah, where did this rumor come from that it's a, an old person's disease? Is it just because the majority of the people that have died from it so far have been older? Yes. In fact, that's the primary risk factor for dying is being old and then having certain underlying health problems. For example, in China, uh, those men over the age of 70 who also smoked, were 8 to 10 percent of them died. 65 percent of older Chinese men smoke. The uh, case fatality rate or the percentage of people who die in women in that same age group was only about 2%. In mm. that case, w very few women smoke. Now, the challenge we have is that that's the Chinese data. But there are a series of risk factors that we worry about that if they overlay on this disease are going to cause bad outcomes. And we happen to be right at ground zero for one of the major ones here in this country, and that's obesity. Mm. Uh, we know that obesity is just like smoking in terms of its ability to really cause severe life-threatening disease, and 45% of our population today over the age of 45 in this country are obese or severely obese, and there's men and women. So one of the concerns we have is we're going to see more 
of these, uh, what I guess I would call very serious and life-threatening cases occur in our country because of a different set of risk factors than we saw in China. Now, you mentioned that there's some sort of an incubation period before people become sick, they're still contagious. What is this incubation period and how do we know about it? When we call something an incubation period, we're talking about from the time you and I got exposed, meaning I was in a room breathing the air that somebody else who was infected Uh, what the virus was expelling out, I breathed it in. How long from that time period till the time period that you get sick? And what is that? That's what we call the incubation period. So that's when case numbers can double or triple in every so many days. In this case, it's about four days. So, And we actually have data there from people who are exposed one time or one time only. And we know when they were exposed, where they were exposed, and how soon do they get sick afterwards. So the chauffeur in the car where an individual was sick or showing symptoms, then the chauffeur gets it four days later. You know, they were there one time and one time only. And if the chauffeur does not show any symptoms, he's still contagious. He He, he could also be contagious too. And that's one of the things that's challenging here is you and I might get exposed to somebody who is totally asymptomatic, no symptoms. That virus would appear, well, that's not a very strong virus. But in fact, when it infects us, it could kill us. So we've seen cases of, of fatal disease that were exposed to people that had minor symptoms themselves. Wow. And this is what's unfolding here. And and this is where I think is such an important, and I said why the timing is so important because, you know, Joel, we really have got to get information out to the public. There is so much misinformation right now. And, you know, we're going to be in this for a while. This is not going to happen overnight. And I worry, I keep telling people we're handling this like it's a corona blizzard, you know, two or three days, Mm -hmm. we're back to normal. This is a coronavirus winter. And we're going to have the next three months or more, six months or more, that are going to be like this. And, you know, so far this thing has been unfolding exactly as we predicted it. We and our center put out a piece uh, on January 20th and said this is going to spread worldwide. At the time, people said, ah, no, it's just China. We put out a piece the first week of February and said this is going to pop probably the last week of February, first week of March. Because what happens is it has what's called an r naught or a doubling time of, of, of these every four days. So two, two increases doubling every four days. So if you go from 2 to 4 to 8 to 16, it takes a while to build up. But when you start going from 500 to 1,000 to 2,000 to 4,000, that's what we're seeing happen in places like Italy. We're beginning to see it in some ways up in Seattle. It's what happened in China. And, uh, you know, when people are confronted with that, suddenly this low-risk phenomenon that everybody talks about isn't so low anymore. And that's what we need to prepare people for. Now, what can be done? Like, what, what can the average person do? I see people walking around with masks on, wearing gloves. Is that nonsense? Largely, yes. Yeah. First of all, um, let's step back. The primary mechanism for transmission is just the respiratory route. It's just breathing. Um, in studies in Germany, which just have been published literally in the last 24 hours, um, they actually followed a group of people who had been exposed to somebody in an automobile manufacturing plant, and then they had nine people that, with this exposure, he said, if you have any symptoms at all, contact us. We want to follow up. And they all agreed. Well, they got infected. And so in the very first hours, just feeling bad, sore throat, they went in and sampled their throats, their, their saliva, their nose for virus. They did blood. They did stool. They did urine. And they found that at that very moment, when they first got sick, they had incredibly high levels of virus, sometimes 10,000 times that we saw with SARS in their throats meaning they were infectious at that point already, and they hadn't even had symptoms yet of really any nature. They weren't coughing yet. Wow. And, and that's where we're concerned because that's the kind of transmission. It's, you know, I always have said in trying to stop influence, virus transmission, like trying to stop the wind. You know, we d- we've never had anything successfully do that other than vaccine, and we don't have a vaccine here. So what's happening is that people in public spaces are getting infected. And the way you need to address that is, unfortunately, if you're older, over 55, you have some underlying health problems, which unfortunately a lot of Americans do. We have uh, obesity. Then right now you don't want to be in large public spaces and trying to potentially get infected. So you can take care of that part. As far as what can public health do, we're not gonna, we can talk about this. We're not going to have a vaccine anytime soon. That's happy talk. Um, what we, you know, we can close schools. One of the big challenges we have right now, if we close schools, what do we accomplish? In influenza virus, when we close schools during outbreaks because it turns out kids get infected in school and they're like little virus reactors. You know, they come home and they transmit it to mom and dad and brothers and sisters. And uh, so we close schools sometimes. Christmas breaks are always great for kind of putting the dampening effect on flu. In this case, kids are not getting sick 
very often at all, which is one of the really good news features of this disease. In China, only 2.1% of the cases were under 19 years of age. And well, why is that? You know, we don't completely know. Uh, and, and I'm going to come to that in a second because they're getting infected, it turns out. One study showed that they still get infected with the virus, but they don't get sick. And we have that happen. There's a disease called infectious hepatitis, hepatitis A, where we have outbreaks in daycares. And the way we know we have an outbreak is because it's transmitted through the stool, fecal oral, is mom and dad and the daycare providers all get sick. And the kids, those symptoms, we go in and test the kids, are all positive. So some diseases will manifest my primary when you're an adult, but not as a child. This one appears to be the same. So do we close schools or not if we're not really spreading the disease? Because it turns out that if we close schools, we, a recent study done showed that 38% of nurses today in this country who are working in the medical area have kids in school. And if suddenly we're closing schools for two or three months, who's going to take care of those kids? One-fourth of the American population has no sick leave. If we close schools, they don't get paid if they have to stay home. So when you ask what can we do, we have to really be thoughtful about what we do. Are we doing more harm than good by closing schools, for example, even though everybody will say, oh, we got to do everything we can? Or do we just tell people, you know, it's going to be limiting your contact as much as you can, and that's really about what we can do. And limiting the contact, is that really going to help? It does because it's like putting rods in a reaction. If you, if you don't have as much close contact, you can – you know, not transmit as much. If I'm, if I'm sitting in a room with 100 people and we're kind of sharing air, the transmission's remarkable. Right here you know, off the coast of California, you've got your cruise ship. Cruise ships are mm-hmm. notorious for recirculating air inside the inner cabins. We've had a number of outbreaks. That's well, why they're having these outbreaks on cruise yeah. ships? Yeah, and then you leave them on there. I think the, uh, the cruelest human experiment we've done in a long time with yeah. humans is leave them on these ships. Get them off right away. Should they get them off oh, right away? Oh, absolutely. And what get should they on. do with them? Well, they can put them in quarantines of some kind if they want and follow up on them, but you're guaranteed they're all going to keep getting infected day after day. It seems like we're not really prepared for something like this, although the, the CDC has been telling us for a long time that we should be. You know, we are uh, not prepared at all in the sense, you know, I uh, wrote the book, um, Deadliest Enemies, that was published in 2017. Right thank here, you. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> thank you. Go get it. No. Read it. And Panic. In a, chapter 13, the title of the chapter was SARS and MERS, A Harbinger of Things to Come. You know, we oh predicted this. And then I wrote a chapter on there what a flu pandemic would look like if it emerged in China. And if you read it, it's exactly what's happened. The supply chains went down. China locked down the country. It spread to other countries. People all pointed fingers. And, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing where we hear it and hear it, but we don't get prepared. You know, five years ago, I gave a talk at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, first time I talked about this, I talked many times afterwards. And I showed a slide of Puerto Rico, a picture of Puerto Rico. And then I showed the map. And then I showed a picture of a building in Puerto Rico, a nondescript building. And I said, this is our next big disaster. Turns out that 85% of all the world's production of IV bags, the saline that we need desperately, were made in these plants in Puerto Rico. And all we needed was one, one Category 5 hurricane to come through and take it out. Maria came through a year and a half ago, and the world went into a major crisis with a shortage of IV bags. Now, that was so obvious that was going to happen, and yet we don't prepare. That's so foolish. I know. I agree. And that's what hopefully this is a wake-up call. The business community, I hopefully, will wake up. You know, one of the other things we're doing right now, uh, Joe, this is really one of the things that has me most concerned about this whole situation is our group has been studying for the last year and a half uh, with support from the Walton Family Foundation um, looking at critical drug shortages. It turns out that we identified 153 drugs in this country that people need right now or they die. I mean, it's on the crash card. It's acute critical drugs. 100% are generic. All of them basically are made offshore of the United States. And a large part of them are made in China and India. And at this point, we have shortages anyway every day, just before this crisis happened. Now these supply chains have gone down. Our group is actively helping the United States government try to figure out, you know, where they're going to get these drugs. Now just think of this. If I came to you and said the Defense Department was going to outsource all its munitions production to China, you'd look at me and say, come on. You know what? The U.S. Defense Department has no more access to these drugs than anybody else. They are beholden to China for these drugs. 690,000 Americans have end-stage renal disease right now. Most of their primary drugs are coming from China. And now with the shutdown, 
And what's happening with this, and this is what I talked about in the book, why I was so concerned, because we are at risk. So even the situation is unfold, it's not just about what the virus does to you. It's about what the entire system is rigged up to be and what this virus does once it gets into it. Jesus. You're making me nervous. Well, but that's before we get done here. We're going to talk about what we can do to get people not nervous because this what? is – It's too late. <laughs> no, no, no. What I mean is we're, we're, going to, we're going to bring you around to take – you know, it's my job is not to scare you out of your wits. It's to scare you into your wits. <laughs> Europe has now become the epicenter of the global coronavirus pandemic, according to the World Health Organization. And this comes as several European nations have recorded a surge in the number of cases and fatalities. Europe has now become the epicenter of the pandemic, with more reported cases and deaths than the rest of the world combined, apart from China. And Italy has recorded its highest single-day jump in terms of its death toll with over 250 deaths having been recorded in just the past 24 hours. The country has got more than 17,660 confirmed cases of infections and the death toll in this has now risen to 1,266. The country continues to reel under a lockdown. Meanwhile, the European Commission has promised to provide Italy with whatever support it needs. And this comes after complaints that Brussels has been pretty slow to react to the viral outbreak. We are absolutely ready to help uh, Italy with whatever is necessary. This is of utmost importance. This country is severely hit by uh, coronavirus. And uh, we all know that uh, they need help right now. So whatever is necessary, we support. Whatever they need, we will answer. All right, now to give us more insights in terms of what's actually playing out within Italy at this point of time that has now emerged as the epicenter of the viral infection, we're joined in by Mr. Rafal Marchetti, who is a Deputy Rector for International Relations and also a Professor, professor for International Affairs who's joining us live from Rome. Uh, so Mr. Marchetti, let me begin by asking you this. In the last 24 hours, Italy has witnessed more than 200 deaths related to the novel coronavirus infections. Give us a sense of, as to what is presently going on in Italy, considering the fact that for the last several days, the entire nation of Italy has been under a state of lockdown. In order to understand the situation, you need to have a time lapse of two weeks. So what is happening now is a spurred from activities that took place two weeks ago. At the moment, the entire country is locked down. Universities, schools like mine are shut down. We moved all the teaching online. Um, most of the shops and commercial activities are closed. Of course, not those providing food and, uh, and health care. Um, what we expect is that in two weeks' time, um, significant diminishing of the uh, uh, occurrence will take place. For the moment, the next uh, 10 days, I mean, the, the shutdown took place a few days ago, the next, let's say, 10 days will be crucial uh, and will be probably the toughest. Uh, but after that, we expect a sharp decline in the spread of the viruses. I think it's important that you're saying that the next 10 days are going to be very crucial considering the trajectory that the number of infections are likely to be seen. You know, but there are reports that are coming in that the provinces of Lombardy and Veneto, the northern provinces, are very badly affected. And at this point of time, they don't even have adequate medical supplies and even ICU beds for the very worst affected. Yes, of course, there is an issue about sustainability. You need to think about the fact that uh, health uh, infrastructures have been built up uh, for a normal situation, but this is an extraordinary situation. So no country is ready to face such an exceptional state. Uh, there are two other important issues here to be considered. On the one hand, that of course you want to tackle the health issue, but you want to have a trade-off with the economy. Mm -hmm. You don't want to save the country from the health situation and kill the country in economic terms. So this is a very big challenge. Second very big challenge 
is international cooperation. Italy, I think, is on the right track now, and the facts will come in two weeks' time. But the issue is, how are the other European countries, how is the US, how are the other countries around the world facing the situation? Our impression in Italy is that at the moment, there is an overlooking of the situation, an underestimation. And so, so the problem might be solved in some country. In China, is going to be solved soon. Korea, Italy, we expect in two weeks' time. But then what is going to happen to the other countries? That's the issue. I think that's, that's an important point that you've raised in terms of what will be the collective response to these infections around the world. But I want to talk a bit more in terms of what's happening within Italy. The population of Italy is said to be about 60 million people, and all of those people have been placed under a state of lockdown. How has this impacted a normal life, the normal life for the locals in Italy? Are they even allowed to step out? How, how much of these restrictions are put in place? What can and cannot the people of Italy do at this point of time when the entire nation is under a lockdown? Uh, this is bringing dramatic changes to the lives of every single Italian citizen. Uh, basically, you are not allowed to go out only for, uh, I mean, going and doing some shopping for food or health reasons. For the rest, you are not allowed to go out. You are not allowed to travel, of course, from one day to the other. Uh, you need to stay at home. You need to stay at home alone with your family. Uh, and this is a radical turn in the lifestyle of every single Italian uh, citizen. Um, you rediscover many old activities. Uh, you feel, of course, constrained. But on the overall, I would say that uh, now, today, Italians uh, realize this is necessary. And so they are coping with that. Obviously, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is transforming and will be transforming. The, the the society for once we rely how we realize how important is the personal contact we, we 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 thought for a long time that digital transformation was going to transform our lives but now we realize uh personal contact physical contact is important so you realize it when you miss it absolutely indeed and lastly just before i go uh, let you go mr marchetti you know italy is the third largest economy in the eurozone how badly do you think you know, the outbreak of the novel coronavirus infections is likely to impact the Italian economy. Uh, it will have a serious impact. Obviously, this is not caused by economic reasons, but by health reasons. So it's a kind of an external variable that will disappear, hopefully, uh, soon. But inevitably, there will be uh, da damages. Some uh, companies will uh, go bankrupt. The government is setting in place a, a, a kind of contingent, contingency measures to help those businesses, those companies to survive. Uh, we will see. Uh, the Italian government and also from yesterday, the European Commission uh, promised and pledged uh, substantial funding. This will be crucial because otherwise uh, an important segment of the economy could be killed by this health problem. All right, we'll have to leave there. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Rafael Marchetti. Thank you very much indeed for talking to us.